Um, our, you know, this morning we heard, you know, from a number of uh, government agencies, and now we're going to hear from a number of, you know, the leading cloud providers, um, you know, all of who you know. Um, and here to moderate the session is um, SIA's own David LaDuke, who's our Senior Director of Public Policy and works closely with, um, you know, our panelists. So I'll turn it over to David. David, introduce the panel. Thanks, Rihanna. This on? Thanks so much, Rihanna. It's a to be here today, and, and we've got an excellent panel. Um, th this event is, is largely, largely IT folks speaking to the audience, but we do like to mix it up and think it's very valuable to integrate um, cloud providers and, and get the perspective of cloud providers. Uh, and in, in this expert panel, what we'd like to do is to explore um, not only the basics of cloud computing, obviously, but to get into, into some of the, the details of the, the bigger picture on the cloud. Uh, a lot of the emphasis, as, as Dave McClure mentioned, is, is on shared services um, and integrating cloud computing to increase efficiency and, and, and save money, reduce costs. And um, I'd like to talk with, with some of these experts and get their insights into, into how they believe um, the government's doing, uh, how it's working out, and, and, to, and to provide uh, advice and insights to, to uh, agency folks here with us today. So the four panelists I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce, Dan Burton is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Global Public Sector for Salesforce.com. Uh, Dan played a leadership role in develop, uh, development of U.S. technology policy for over 20 years. Prior to joining Salesforce in 2006, Dan uh, also served with uh, Ntrust and, and worked for Novell. Um, and he was also president of the Council on Competitiveness, where he was a pioneer in the effort to establish government technology policies for the high-tech industry. Um, Gunnar Hellickson, uh, down there, uh, is the chief technology strategist for Red Hat's U.S. public sector group, where he works with system integrators and government agencies to encourage the use of open source software in government. Um, Gunnar is one of Federal Computer Week's Fed 100 for 2010. That was a big, big honor for Gunnar a couple years ago. And he's an active member of the Military Open Source Working Group and a GTO 21 commissioner. Um, David Mahalchek with Google. On the end, uh, David is the head of Google Apps Federal, and he focuses on bringing Google's cloud computing technology to government customers to help them improve performance and reduce costs. David also manages Google's compliance with FISMA and other federal security requirements. Prior to joining Google, David was a senior manager at, in Accenture's federal strategy practice. And finally, Andrus Sokol uh, with IBM. He's the vice president and chief technology officer of IBM uh, US Federal. Andros is responsible for IBM's industri indi industry solution technology strategy in support of the US federal customer. Um, Andras was appointed IBM Distinguished Engineer and Director of IBM's Federal Software Architecture Team in 2005, uh, and he leads a department of technologists responsible for developing e-government software architectures using IBM technology and solutions. Um, with that introduction, again, it's a delight to have you all here joining us today. Uh, I thought we would just start out with some brief remarks. Uh, might as well go in alphabetical order. Dan, would you like to kick it off? Sure. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I remember when this conference was SASGov, and now it's CloudGov, and who knows, it may have a, more, a few more iterations uh, to go. And I would like to just start with the comment that the cloud computing debate is over. Uh, and I think it's over in two fundamental ways that it's important to recognize. I think, first of all, it's over in the public sector and government, which is what we're focused on here because there is no uh, vendor, there is no integrator, uh, there is no consultant out there who says the cloud is uh, not the way to go. Uh, so everyone has realized that it is inevitable that the federal government, just like state and local governments, will shift to cloud platforms, uh, cloud infrastructures, cloud applications, uh, and that that train has left the station and there's still a lot of work to do in terms of what do those implementations look like, uh, what's the best model, uh, what is genuine cloud offerings. Uh, we think it's uh, sort of multi-tenancy. Um, and what is uh, really a, a false cloud. Uh, I think the, the, the other trend is the cloud debate is also over in a different way. Uh, and uh, certainly this is how we view the world at Salesforce. Uh, 
And our CEO, Mark Benioff, said in 1999 uh, that Salesforce was born social, a born cloud, uh, and that we were really the poster child for a lot of cloud applications. And in 2009, 10 years later, we were reborn social. And we really feel like that uh, uh, the whole push for organizations is going to be towards a social enterprise. And that is, how do you take these cloud technologies uh, provided on a multi-tenant architecture accessed uh, securely over the internet, anywhere on mobile devices. How do you take those to change culture and create a social enterprise? The private sector is already off to the races doing that. Uh, the public sector, oddly enough, is further along than people may think. If you look at GSA, for example, uh, uh, Dave McClure spoke this morning, and GSA has a whole social uh, strategy that they're pursuing. Very interesting. So I think th those are the big opening comments. The cloud debate is over. It's over because everyone agrees that it is inevitable, uh, both on the, the IT side as well as on the customer side. And it's over because there's a whole new phase we're moving into, and it's uh, all about social enterprise. Great. You might as well just go on that. <laughs> we'll just go down the line. All right, great. Uh, Andras Sakal again of IBM. I, I jotted down a few thoughts listening to some of the speakers today, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, so we've come out of this um, recent last few years of extreme excitement around cloud computing to realize that, you know, that there's a little bit more than, than just cloudiness involved, right? And it's this realization that you know, it's a paradigm shift that has many different shifts underneath of, quote, the cloud, right? You have resource pooling, you have virtualization, you even have big data, uh, analytics, uh, cybersecurity, and, and even the administration's recent um, you know, identification of the need to move to shared services is a realization that there are multiple paradigms within the cloud, right? So kind of cloudy um, techniques and, and, and shifts are going on. You know, historically, if we look at, at paradigm shifts, um, they were very concrete, but you know, technology is moving so rapidly that many of these shifts are occurring at the same time. You know, mobility, uh, collaboration, social computing, all occurring um, simultaneously. So, when we talk about cloud, we have to be concrete in terms of what our strategy is and what our implementations are. So certainly IBM offers a, a wide breadth of te technologies that run from hybrid cloud uh, to our uh, government um, community cloud. And uh, we're embracing the idea of shared services and SaaS services and offering um, the appropriate services, you know, the, the primary uh, services that we're offering in the cloud, you know, when we talk about in the cloud, we're talking about, you know, off-prem, really, in this community, are around uh, email collaboration, inter enterprise um, uh, messaging, uh, content management, and, and then there are some, you know, really appropriate opportunities for many of the agencies who run kind of uh, virtual market commerce uh, type of applications to create, you know, Peapod-like services. Uh, and, and we have a significant presence uh, already in the, in the commercial SaaS environment um, with Sterling Commerce that we're offering in, in the federal space. Um, I think it's really important that <clears throat> You know, if you take a if if you take the tactical approach to cloud computing, um, you're liable to uh, become fragmented and uh, disassociated with your business architecture that needs to inform your enterprise architecture, which eventually uh, defines your IT implementation to support the the uh, the implementation of your strategic business mission. So I think we really need to get down into um, as uh, strategists, as leaders, as technologists, understanding the implications of selecting cloudy technologies um, to support our enterprise architecture and business missions. And I think, you know, IBM obviously has a wide variety of technologies to do that. 
Um, all right, so the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Gunnar Hellickson from uh, Red Hat. Uh, so Red Hat's, as most of you probably know, the largest uh, pure open source company in the world. We're, with any luck, we'll hit a uh, billion dollars a year uh, this year, which is right around, which is pretty amazing considering we sell free software, right? Um, so the, as an open source advocate, um, and uh, I see a lot of compliments between these cloud, uh, cloud implementations and cloud consumption models and, and open source, as you can imagine. Um, and like my colleagues over here, there's, there are, uh, cloud is actually composed of a number of actually much more boring problems underneath, right? I mean, they're actually persistent problems. There's nothing new about them. Um, and we see this in some of the guidance that's come out of OMB, right? So we've got uh, shared first, uh, which is trying to encourage, yet again, uh, reuse amongst the agencies. I mean, we've been at this for 30 years, but maybe, maybe this time it'll work. Um, uh, we see things like a FedRAMP uh, trying to in ensure some kind of sharing of, uh, not of implementation, but of, of process, right? So the security process. Um, so trying to lower the barrier to entry for new applications and also trying to, uh, to decrease the implementation costs of the, of the stuff that we've, uh, that we've already got. Um, so I see there's a, uh, there, th this path is kind of fraught with peril, though, uh, because a lot of people are moving to cloud and believe that uh, uh, cloud is, uh, well, if I, buy this, if I buy this piece of equipment from a vendor roughly the size of a refrigerator, uh, maybe that'll be a cloud, right? And then I can go tell my boss that I did a cloud implementation and, uh, and OMB won't give us a hard time for spending money on it. Um, I think that uh, there, is, there is still too much thinking in that way. I think that certainly Dan and I agree that uh, a cloud is much more about having services on demand, having uh, much more elasticity and flexibility in your, in your infrastructure, um, and buying a refrigerator is kind of the opposite of flexibility and agility, right? Um, so this is why OMB is consolidating is encouraging agencies to consolidate capital spending uh, with the CIOs. Uh, because if we keep having all the capital expenses distributed throughout each of the programs, <clears throat> it becomes very difficult to kind of corral everyone and get them onto a shared architecture, right? Um, I think the, uh, again, the, the shared first policy, which is in draft now and may be deployed, a, well, I'm not sure when they're gonna roll it out, hopefully by April, because that's the first deliver that's when the first deliverables do. But the, the shared first policy is, is really interesting. It's, it tells agencies basically, um, before you go buy a new item, before you go buy a new capability, you need to go make sure that another agency hasn't already purchased it. Um, and, and if you do buy a new uh, item, then, then you need a note from your doctor. Um, so it's, it, this, is the, uh, this is kind of a higher order version of the cloud first policy that we've been working under for the last, for the last two years. Um, I think that the shared first policy is gonna drive a lot of well, obviously sharing amongst the agencies, but it is also <coughs> gonna encourage agencies to be much more modular in their thinking. Um, they're gonna start taking these big monolithic applications and start decomposing them uh, a little bit into discrete pieces, because uh, it's easier to share many small pieces than it is to share one big monolithic application. Um, I don't know, I got my fingers crossed. This is gonna be kind of an exciting time over the next two years between Cloud First, uh, Shared First, and, and FedRAMP. I think we're, uh, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about kind of a profound change, not just in the way we implement IT and federal government, but also in how we procure it. Thanks. David? I agree. It is a very exciting time. Um, and I, I, I agree with many of the points that have been uh, made here by, by my colleagues. I'll, I'll, I'll go over j just, just a few from, from, from our point of view in terms of, uh, of what we're seeing in, in the public sector and federal, state, and local government. Uh, the cloud is mainstream in government. Uh, we have seen in incredible adoption that, that's happened in the public sector, in the state and local government, and in the federal government. I think that has outpaced expectations. I started at Google uh, about five years ago, and, and, and when I started, people told me I was crazy to be doing it. Once they found out what I was doing, oh, you're working on cloud computing and government. Uh, that's a bad idea. You're crazy for, for doing this, because uh, the government will never adopt cloud computing. Maybe this will happen uh, in the state and local government or a county government somewhere, but it would never happen in the federal government because the federal government has all of these requirements and FISMA and the way they procure things. This, this will never happen. So uh, set something up for, uh, for later uh, uh, because this is not gonna happen in, in, in the federal government. And lo and behold, uh, it, it has happened. And, and not only has it happened, it's, it's, it's becoming mainstream. So um, we, we see with, um, uh, in, in the case of Google's applications, which are for 
uh, messaging and collaboration, so things like email, instant messaging, uh, collaborations for documents, spreadsheets, and presentations and video. All, th this platform, which is available 100% through a web browser, um, is now being used by whole state governments, like the state of Wyoming, the state of Utah, uh, and, and whole uh, cities, like the city of Philadelphia, the city of Orlando, and, uh, and counties and police stations, and, uh, and, and it's being used by entire federal agencies, like the General Services Administration and, and NOAA. So we've seen this uh, really take off, and we've seen other agencies now interested in replacing their email and collaboration systems with, with a cloud-based system. And as uh, others have mentioned, we've seen the, the government begin to set up the processes that, that are required to really help spur this adoption e even further. So, um, <clears throat> so I think that that's the first point uh, around the momentum that we've seen in the, in, the, uh, in the government space with cloud. I think the second point is that we're, we're realizing that, that the benefits of cloud and the drivers for, for moving to cloud computing are not just about the, the CIO's office. They're not just about uh, the benefits for, for back-end IT, which are significant, unquestionably. Uh, and, and, and it is a, a, one, a one very important driver. The other driver, I, I think, that is becoming more predominant now is that it's, it's, it's the realization that cloud computing is not just about doing the same thing cheaper, but it's about doing things that you couldn't do before. And, and this is where the, the benefits to federal employees, uh, to overall productivity, to the ability to be able to, to work smarter and, and in a different way. I hear from federal employees uh, all the time that they are more productive uh, at home managing their kid's soccer game uh, or their child's uh, preschool or, or, or you name it, or you know, managing their, uh, their wedding uh, with consumer tools than they are at work. Uh, President Obama has, has said that the children of federal employees have more powerful technology in their backpack on the way to school than many of their parents do when they get to their desk at, at the federal government. And, and, and this is true. There is a lot of frustration. And, and it has to do with an enterprise uh, model that um, has not been on the same path of innovation as the consumer model. Uh, so, so what Google is, is, is doing is to take our consumer technology, bring it to the enterprise, and jump that, uh, that innovation curve. And what it allows for is the expectations that federal employees have from what they're using at home, they're able to get these same type, type of capabilities uh, at work. They're able to work in the same document at the same time with 20 other people working in the document character by character, seeing what each one of them is, is, is writing. Uh, they're, they're able to have 25 gigabytes of storage in, in the mailbox. They're able to do a video chat with someone uh, in, in another country right from the, the web browser. They're able to, to, to work from home uh, and, and be very effective. So, so all of those things. It's not just about doing the same thing cheaper. That's not very exciting. It's, it's about uh, doing things you couldn't do before. And I think the, the last point I, I would make is that the cloud is enabling other objectives uh, of, of where the federal government wants to get to. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, social, a very important objective that's being uh, enabled by, by cloud computing platforms. And I think the other is, is mobility uh, and, and the desires around uh, more choices for, uh, for, for federal government employees and public sector employees in the area of mobile. So when you have a cloud computing platform, that, that is web-based, based on, based on open standards, we're seeing other possibilities open up in terms of uh, mobile platforms. So we see more and more agencies uh, e either moving away from some of their uh, traditional mobile platforms to others or diversifying their mobile platform so that, uh, again, more and more of their, their employees can have that experience that they have in the consumer world, an iPhone, an Android device, a Windows phone, whatever, whatever it might be, they have that experience now at, at work as well, and, and the cloud is enabling that. Uh, those are my thoughts. Great. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for opening with uh, very insightful thoughts. Um, you know, th there's a theme that, uh, that definitely 
resonated across the four panelists. And obviously, we've got four companies here that represent um, a different, com in some cases, different components of, of uh, enabling cloud. So I think that's that's useful. Um, the, but the notion of smarter, better, social, and mobile were, were four things that I that I took away, and that, you know I think I wanted to focus our discussion on as key points of the cloud. As Dan mentioned, we're, we've been here for years. We've been talking about this for years, but. The further along we've gone, and I think Salesforce is a perfect example of this, we're not just talking about cloud anymore, we're talking about how it's better, you know, how, how it's mobile, how it's faster. So I mean, I think that's, uh, I think that's great. That's part of what I'd like to talk about uh, more today. But one of the, the high-level questions I, I'd like to start off talking about is security. And security is another issue we've been talking about for so long. You know, I, I, feel like, I feel like we've really made a lot of progress on that. Five years ago, we talked cloud. People say, cloud? Ooh, I don't know. Is it secure? What? I, I can't trust the cloud. I mean, is that pretty much, everyone gets it now, right? I mean, Dan, you want to talk to that? Yes, well, thank you for that question, David, because that is still the threshold question. And, uh, and this is where I think the, the public debate in Washington has not been helpful. Vivek Kundra, who was former federal CIO and who is now my boss at Salesforce, was famous for saying, I want government to stop hiding behind the private cloud. And so there was this sense that, gee, if you're government and you really need security, you have to have a private cloud. Uh, and then that was defined in ways so that it really looked like a lot like outsourced legacy IT infrastructure, with, which people had been doing for 20, 30 years. And the real issue is if you're a federal agency, you don't care whether you have a public cloud or a private cloud or a banana cloud. What you really care about is does your vendor meet federal security requirements? That is the discussion. It's not what the model is. And if you look at a company like Salesforce, we were actually the second company after Google, you get the moderate FISMA certification from GSA, we have a moderate FISMA certification from the SEC, we have moderate FISMA certification from the Department of the Interior. We have moderate FISMA certification from HHS. We have a moderate FISMA certification from the Department of Commerce. So it's like these security issues have been addressed. And rather than put them in this false taxonomy, or gee, is it a public cloud, and that must be insecure, or a private cloud, and that is de facto secure, that is really a nonsensical way to talk about this. And what agencies should look at is what are the federal security requirements is my vendor meeting them, and can I trust them with confidence? Anyone else want to expand on that? Or is that sure, I'm, I think we're probably all going to want to make a comment on this <coughs> topic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would agree with Dan that uh, you know, we, we understand as an industry how to secure um, SaaS services um, or whatever cloud service you're providing. Um, IBM has a, a medium uh, robustness cloud. We also have a high assurance cloud that um, you know we can place uh, uh, a high assurance um, Intel DoD applications into. Um, that's probably something that not many others can can say. Uh, we're we're implementing uh, cloud solutions uh, that provide uh, storage as a service, platform as a service, uh, in infrastructure as a service. Uh, and we're, we're adopting computing, uh, utility computing models in order to actually provide that option uh, for uh, the, the program or agency. However, uh, that said, I mean, I, uh, our belief is that uh, you, know, there, you need to have a well-defined business architecture which informs your enterprise architecture, which ultimately defines and informs your implementation architecture, and it's not about whether or not you're outsourcing your technology it's about whether you have the right solution. And um, you know, this is where I think we would differ in, in others in the industry who would say, you need to give up all of your IT infrastructure to us. Um, you know, I think that's a, an, an option. Um, it's probably, you know, it's a message you're gonna hear from uh, uh, companies that are offering that one dimension of SaaS, but you need to think in terms of how your technology infrastructure needs to uh, change or, or uh, evolve with these new cloudy technologies with, uh, in, in, in parallel with the, the strategic business mission. But I just want to stop you all before, before we continue. Um, I've got a request for everyone to 
slowly put your hand in your pocket and if you have a phone, either turn it off or pull it out and, and <laughs> set, it on the, uh, set it away from your mic just so that we don't have interference. But I left mine over there and I feel a little uncomfortable being so far away. So someone's probably talking on it. Go, go ahead, Connor. Um, so uh, the, the security, the, ca the case of the, the security question is actually, I think, a, a specific instance of, of the larger of this like larger trend where like, cloud is being used as a, as a forcing function to get agencies and vendors to do the stuff they should have been doing in the first place, right? Um, because as people move to these cloud environments, they have to change, again, how their procurement works, right? Um, uh, the FedRAMP, right, came about because uh, Amazon didn't want to file for uh, FISMA paperwork 17 times for 17 different agencies, right? Um, well, that makes sense. Um, would that we had something like FedRAMP 10 years ago, even before, I mean, put cloud to the side, right? Just to, for a vendor to be able to point to a central repository of FISMA paperwork and say, no, no, we're already approved, and you can just reuse this guy's paperwork, that would have been amazing. Um, and so, uh, thankfully, cloud has come along, and now that's kind of cleared the decks, and now, uh, and now we get to take a close look at how, we, uh, how the acquisition works, um, how our CNA works, um, how our enterprise architectures work. I know a number of agencies are, uh, thinking about cloud deployments or they're under these cloud mandates and they suddenly realize, like, oh, wait a minute, we don't have an enterprise architecture. We need to quick get an enterprise architecture so now we can, so we can actually properly move this stuff in the cloud uh, because you can't take the same mess that's in your data center and move it up to, uh, to Dan's product, right, or, or Andre's product or, 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 or Dave's product. Um, so I think the, uh, the security question is now, again, it's an implementation question. Um, I agree with, uh, I agree with the, the last two. I, I think it's, uh, um, it's a question, not whether is it secure or isn't it secure, it's um, how do we actually get security right in the, in the first place. Anything to add, David? Uh, again, I, I agree with much of what's been said. Uh, security is, is very important. It's, it's extremely important for, uh, for Google. In, in the end, uh, security is important for, for information technology, period, whether it's cloud or, or anything else. And you can evaluate the security of, of cloud computing as you can evaluate the security of, of other information technology. You can have an, an empirical review of the security controls that, that are in place, and you can analyze them based on the, the risk frameworks that exist in the federal government uh, today. And that's exactly what's, what's been done, and that's what's uh, enabled the public sector to adopt uh, our technology with, uh, with confidence. So we're, we're going to continue to stay uh, focused in this area of security. Uh, and I think it's, it's worth bringing, pointing out, I, I guess, two things I would add. One is that we find that there are many agencies that see they get a security upgrade from, uh, from, from moving to, to a cloud computing environment. There are a number, uh, I was speaking with one federal agency that, uh, that today is, uh, has an outs a traditional uh, uh, outsourced uh, model for, for, their, for their email where, uh, an integrator is, is running their email environment on premise. It's at FISMA low today, um, and and there are there are over fifty thousand users on on this uh, on this email system. So, so many agencies see, see an upgrade by going to, uh, to to FISMA Modern, or even agencies at FISMA Modern today see that uh, in the cloud there are some things that we're able to do on a large scale with security uh, in managing some of the controls that that may not be in place uh, today. But, uh, I, and, and, and I, I do agree very much with Dan in terms of this point on what we're seeing in these original definitions established by NIST now going on five years ago when we look at the definitions of cloud computing and the delivery models and public-private community. I, I, do think it's been, I do think it's been confusing because we're really looking at the delivery model as a proxy for what the security is and it's, it's, it's not true. A private cloud by its nature is not more secure for being called private. It may be more secure, absolutely. Uh, you can make a private cloud suitable for a, uh, for a classified environment if you have the right controls in place. It may have no locks on the door and, uh, and, and a, a convicted felon running, you know, running the operation <laughs> as well. I, I, you don't know. If it's, it's still called a private cloud. So you, you, need to, you need to evaluate the security controls that are in place and not just say, oh, I've got a private cloud, so it, 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 must, be, it must be secure. Uh, you know, I, I compare it to the aviation uh, industry, right? I mean, you might have a, a, a private plane, uh, but it is not necessarily more more secure than a commercial aircraft, right? If it's a if it's a uh, 
uh, you know, a two-seater Cessna and, and I'm flying it, uh, that, that private plane is not as safe <laughs> as, uh, as, as what you'd fly in a, you know, the multi-tenant version of that, a, a uh, 777 from, from United. Uh, so I, 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 think, I think agencies are, are looking at that. Um, and, and security is, is about reviewing the actual security controls that are in place. And I just thought, I'll add to that, actually. I think the, uh, so some of the standards that are coming out of NIST, like uh, uh, it actually came out of the federal desktop core configuration, but are now uh, being taken up into, into this cloud work. So if you read the, uh, the FedRAMP CONOPS, the, they talk, uh, they're pointing uh, directly at standards like SCAP, or the Secure Content Automation Protocol, uh, which is this incredible tool that allows you to uh, send a set of security expectations to your cloud provider, and then they send back uh, a set of results that can be consumed by machines. So now we can, now we're, this, uh, this dream of kind of continuous security monitoring is actually becoming a practical reality. Um, it's really very exciting. And so I, I agree with, I agree with David. I think that um, the, in many cases, it's, it's going to be a security upgrade. Um, if for no other reason, then we're gonna be retooling our security processes in order to accommodate these new, these new cloud deployments. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean, my, my response to that is always, you know, is the cloud secure? I say, compared to what? You know what I mean? And I think that, that really helps people along the line of, oh, oh yeah, it is, because then they start looking at it. And, you know, so that's what I take away. I think we all heard it here. Yes, the cloud is secure. Um, no, it's not one size fits all. You've got public clouds, you've got private clouds, you've got hybrid clouds. We ought not focus on, you know, on the method, but decide you know, the solution that works best, both secure. Um, and I think David McClure touched on those. I'd like to raise uh, another question and inject a point that he made earlier. Um, he was talking a bit uh, about the government being, being a different customer. You know, the government's a diff different customer. Um, he mentioned, obviously, the federal government's focused on low and security, uh, uh, low and moderate security levels. That's where most of the FedRAMP is focused. That's where they've been telling agencies and cloud first to go, go low and moderate first. But, um, you know, so kind of a two-part question to you all. Um, so how is cloud affecting and changing um, the culture of government, and is this something that, that needs to focus on just low and moderate, or can it also, are we also talking about, um, um, you know, critical applications too? Anyone want to take a jump in on that one? I, I think that it definitely, you know, again, if we talk in terms of cloudy technologies, all of these different uh, new paradigms that we have, whether it be resource pooling, virtualization, um, and some of the new t the security technologies, all of these have uh, an opportunity to really modernize our infrastructure, especially if we move towards uh, a kind of a shared first thought. But we have to implement the shared first infrastructure. And then we can embrace you know, whatever delivery model you know, we want uh, that makes the most sense uh, that defines our end-to-end -end, uh, business value chain, right? So uh, I, I, I think that it's important to understand that you know, you need, that's why, I, that's why the federal government, uh, the administration went to this, you know, recently this idea of, you know, shared uh, resources, shared computing uh, infrastructure. And, and it, this is not so dissimilar to some of the uh, work that we did. And in fact, I did, if you look at the AFI website, you know, I have several papers that I, that I uh, authored with uh, several prominent folks at the time on shared services. And that's a five-year-old um, concept. Well, we kind of fell down in our implementation of shared services because SOA really um, was a, uh, an initiative that was so focused on infrastructure and technology that it didn't tie back to business. And it just, you know, the business leaders didn't grok, you know, the, the value of SOA. But in real reality, SOA and cloud computing, you know, cloud computing being kind of the evolution of service-based computing, are very similar, and we still have this need today to implement that shared service infrastructure um, to move forward with cloud computing, including the consumption of, of cloud services that are outside our primary control that are third, third party off-prem uh, provided services. Yeah, I'm, uh, kind of to, to jump on that, I think the, uh, I'm really interested by the platform as a service space um, that is really taking off, especially in, in DOD and the, and the intelligence community. Um, the, and so talking about culture changes, right? Um, it, when you move to these shared services or even to a platform as a service, 
um, a lot of agencies and a lot of these programs think about it as like there are going to be winners and losers, right? Uh, because my value, both as an individual and as an organization, is directly tied to uh, the, the number of, of applications that I own or the number of capabilities that I own. Um, and that's, that's something that, that has to, that in fact, that's called out in the, in the shared first document. I mean, that's something that, has, that, is, that is definitely going to change. It just, it just has to. Um, it's not sustainable, you know, if the capability required is for potato chips, you've got one program, you get salty potato chips, another one salt and pepper, another one's jalapeno, another one's barbecue. I mean, it doesn't, that we can't work like that any longer. Um, and I think what a lot of agencies are realizing is that the, these platform as a service or, or even shared services offerings allow for, um, allow for not just, uh, uh, not just more modularity and not just for you know, the cost savings of, of having a single infrastructure for a particular capability, but also they're finding some advantages in the, uh, in the serendipity that comes with having all of these services available, right? So now we have developers who can suddenly compose capabilities out of stuff that already exists, whereas before that something would have been a $10 million procurement, now a guy can do it in his basement over a weekend. Um, business process management. Business right? process management, right? I mean, it's really, really remarkable uh, transformation, and I think the, uh, you know, the acquisition and the procurement and the CNA processes really have to catch up with this, uh, with the power of, of of what these platforms can do. Yeah, I think this point about culture is is really important, and I think it's what we'll be talking about more and more as we talk yeah. about cloud computing now. And, and when we met at, at this conference you know, five years ago. When we talked about cloud, we were talking more to the uh, to, to the CIO group and, and the benefits of cloud computing and cost savings and the business case. I think that's and security and all of these points. I do think that that is generally uh, understood and accepted, and there are questions about how to implement now and, 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 and choices to be made. But but what what we're we're seeing now is more of this focus on what it means for users, and and it, it means a lot for users, and we still we still don't know yeah. all, all of the impacts, but it's. Uh, what, what we see in terms of the culture is that, that employees are more productive, they're working smarter, they're, 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 they're moving into the, in, into the ways that, uh, that uh, they're required to work now. There's much more collaboration, there's much more working in teams, there's, there's the, the ability to work, uh, to work interagency, the ability to work with, uh, with remote teams. E even things that we saw at, at GSA where the focus was, was on Making sure that the email system was 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 up and running, but uh, but GSA employees had access to uh, to Google Docs as well, and and even though that wasn't a focus of the deployment, we we found that that uh, there were thousands and thousands of users that just looked at this, saw it was available, and they started using uh, Google Docs and recognized that there's a you know a different way to uh, to author content that it's not just you work on something by yourself, you get to the point where you think you're finished, and then you email it to someone else or print it out and bring it to their desk, that you can actually be working on it and, and you know, five other people are watching you type it and they change something, and it can be humbling too, right? They, 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 change, they change something as, as you're typing it, they write their own thing. Uh, it, it's, it's a different way of working. I think that's how we're seeing it change the culture. The, what, what, hap what can happen with platform as a service and, and big data is a totally, uh, uh, New area that I think we've only begun to see yeah. the, the impact on on culture. Mm -hmm. So can I, I? I'll try not to be redundant while agreeing with all of my fellow <laughs> panelists here, uh, because culture is uh, that is the big issue. And I spent 25 years of my life doing public policy, technology policy in Washington across think tanks, different companies. And a year ago, I shifted over to the business side. And the reason that I did that is because I feel that the most important policy issue facing us, facing everyone in this room, many of you probably don't think of yourselves as, as public policy mavens, is to get government on the cloud. And the reason why is that fundamentally changes culture, it changes connections with citizens, it changes the delivery of services, it changes collaboration, and therefore transforms government. So it is a, a profound policy effort that I think that we're all involved in, which is sort of bottled under government procurement, a, a strange place for it to be. And if you look at GSA, uh, so uh, Salesforce has an enterprise license agreement with 17,000 GSA employees and, uh, and, and contractors. And we are following Google with many collaborative tools in there. And Martha Johnson says, I want to use this technology to change the GSA culture. 
And she is very forthright about that. And so I think that is the big payoff from all these technologies. And just as a, as a side comment on platform as a service, I think this is the unwritten story uh, in government right now. Because when we look at platform as a service and Salesforce, according to IDC and I think Gartner, uh, we are the leading uh, platform as a service provider today, bar none. 60% um, of our government pipeline, platform as a service. So what you see, sort of it's not really reported, is all these government agencies are saying, hey, I want this platform because I can develop all these cool applications specific to me, share them across the agency, and uh, I'm just getting a platform uh, as a service solution to do that. So I think that is sort of another big wave that's coming through this marketplace. Thanks, guys. I want to be fair here, but we could all sit here and talk about the cloud all day. And this is, we no, love no this we stuff. couldn't. <laughs> but I, I want to make sure we open it up. We open it up to the uh, to the audience and, and give you all a chance to to raise questions. So if there are folks who have questions, there's a couple of standing mics. I see there's a gentleman here. Perfect. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Jason Bloomberg with ZapThink, a division of Dovell. Uh, I want, my question has to do with service level agreements for the cloud. Now, for infrastructure as a service, it's pretty straightforward because it's pretty much a hosting environment. But we have some uh, software and platform as a service vendors on the, uh, on the panel. So I wanted to ask, well, uh, you know, what, what is your approach to providing SLAs for your SaaS and PaaS customers, in particular in government? That's what we're getting from our government agency clients as well. I want to move to SaaS, but what's our service level agreement? And, and uh, you know, you can't find, say, Salesforce. So Salesforce, the rumor on the blogosphere is that Salesforce doesn't provide SLAs to any customers unless they're really beaten up by a customer. So uh, I don't want to put Salesforce on the spot, but I do. <laughs> I, I, Jason, I'm assuming that question was directed to me. Well, actually, actually Google, Google as well, being both SaaS and PaaS. In Someone else want to take that? <laughs> uh, well, you know, first of all, there's subscription level agreements, different kind of SLA, and, and for uh, we post those on our website. If you're a small company, you want to come in and buy cloud apps or PaaS right off the website, there's a subscription level agreement. If you click through, you can do that. Uh, with our larger government customers, obviously those subscription agreements and the services that go with them are negotiated and they're private to those customers. So. What, about, what about Google? Uh, our, our, ours, ours is on online and, and, and available. Uh, it's a very simple uh, service level agreement when it comes to, to software as a service uh, and, and platform as a service as well. Uh, when, when we do uh, a, a major contract with a government organization, there, there is an opportunity for negotiation around the service level agreement, but it's, it's, it's pretty basic. We, we try to keep it simple about here's what we're promising around uptime and availability and, and, uh, and, and, and some other metrics. And uh, so is, what, what, are you, what are you seeing as the concern? Am I, am I allowed to ask questions back? What, 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 yeah. what, are, what are you seeing well, as the concern? Well, it's sort of interesting having Google and Salesforce on the panel because you, as companies, you've taken you know, very different approaches to this question. Right? Google has just pulled their, all their terms of service together and unified them, but Salesforce has been rather slippery with regards to this, <laughs> distinguishing between subscription and service level agreements. So can I just um, make one comment? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> certainly responsive to the word slippery. <laughs> because if you look at Salesforce's service performance, I would argue that we are the most transparent company out there. If you go to trust.salesforce.com, yeah. I mean, you can see how many uh, transactions we did a day, how fast they are, if there's any uh, uh, service issues or interruptions, uh, and all the information about that. You can see all the security uh, issues that are there, you know, all the privacy issues, how it fits globally, and so we are totally transparent in that. And, uh, and so I, I, th I think that if you are a customer, that's what you care about. And so you can actually look and see how the system is performing, and you can, uh, you can see sort of in real time how well they're doing. So I, you know, I, I know that uh, you probably you know, want to speak just to the traditional SaaS providers about this because there's been this constant discussion about, you know, well, what happens if, you know, the, my, I have multi-tenancy and the government comes in and takes down the site and all that kind of stuff and what is my service level agreements? And, and I agree that th that's very important. Um, however, uh, at the end of the day, customers are looking for concrete SLAs and self-service that are um, part of the contract for implementing the service. Now, some of these are evolving standards that are going to be part of this technology as it evolves. However, IBM has implemented um, a, uh, a layer as part of our architecture of all of our SaaS services 
and all of our computing model capabilities called the BSS layer, the business software services layer, which provides uh, those KPIs and, um, and allows the customer to, to determine their qualities of services through that layer. And, um, and it's very transparent. It, we understand we created transaction-based computing. So we think that over a period of time, this discussion will go away in lieu of the BSS architecture becoming more defined and standardized within the industry. And so as the, well, as the last guy to talk. Um, so they, um, so we, we also have a, a platform as a service. A lot of people don't know we have a product called OpenShift. Uh, the reason why you haven't heard about it is because uh, it's free. Um, and it's mostly for us, it's a, it's a greenhouse or a test bed to try, kind of try some of this stuff out and see, see how customers react to it, see how it transforms the way they work. So, uh, and one of the things that has come up, obviously, is, is SLAs. So if we were to eventually charge money for, uh, for a level of service on this, what kind of SLAs do people require? One thing that's come up a lot, and I think it surprised us, is, uh, is that there be, in, as part of the service level agreement, um, actually having exit costs rolled into the agreement. Um, so that there is, because one of the whole, one of the virtues and one of the things all four of us talk about is, you know, the ability to, you know, move your workload from one place to another and find the best deal and et cetera. Um, that's not possible uh, to procure uh, accurately or, or well unless you know actually what the exit costs for the service is as well as the, as well as the entry cost. The, the, the entire FAR, right, is built around entry costs. Um, it spends no time talking about exit costs. Um, I think, uh, just like FedRAMP, actually, I would love to see um, some kind of a, uh, and you guys may hate me for saying this, but I, I would love to see a kind of pooling of service level agreements or some kind of like common understanding of what a government service level agreement would, would look like. Dawn, I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> uh, I, because I think it would, uh, first of all, it would encourage adoption, uh, but it would also ensure that the government had uh, some kind of consist a consistent set of controls in place. Because um, I think that once you move to a platform as a service or a software as a service, uh, people are going to find it extraordinarily difficult to leave that service um, unless they actually are, con unless the provider is contractually bound to make it easier for them. Uh, but, but this goes back to the old, you know, vendor lock-in discussion too. Yeah. Um, I've never believed in this, you know, the, the whole hype and discussion around vendor lock-in. I think when an organization makes the technology decision, that's based on you know, their strategic directions and their business requirements and they become invested in it, it is, by its very nature, difficult to extract yourself out of that relationship because you've got your business running on that platform. It doesn't matter whether you own it or whether you're going to outsource it. It, it. it is the nature of the beast. There are, there are though, I mean, there are safeguards you can put in place to make it easier or harder. Well, right? you, can, you yeah. can have you know, agreements and some agreements for yeah. how you would basically take back your data, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. but, but even then, you know, it's not only going to be a matter of taking back your data, but what format are you going to take it back in? Yeah. It's, it's going to be a, a, a transformation just like you would do any systems migration or transformation project. It's, it's going to require some elbow grease. And, and just the last point I, I'd make on this is that I, I think there are parallels between this SLA discussion and the security discussion that, that we had earlier. because. Uh, the concept of an SLA is, is not new, or the concept of the government understanding that it needs to have these uh, you know, c contractual uh, uh, assurances in, in place for, for outsourced services that, that it's using, that, that, that's not new. And, and so it's applied to the cloud, I, I, I think the government is, is looking at the same thing. And just like security, in the, in the area of service level agreements, there are areas where the, where the government a actually gets more. Uh, in, in, in our example, and in, in many cloud providers, we have zero planned downtime. Uh, we, so we, we don't factor in planned downtime to our, to our service level agreement. Many existing service level agreements for on-premise and, and even some cloud providers say, yeah, we're, we're up you know, whatever percentage of the time, but we're not including the planned downtime that we have on you know, weekends or, or w whenever it is. Uh, so so that, that's an improvement uh, that, that we see. Uh, I see they're sneaking around the room ready to pull us off the stage here, but I, there's a gentleman who's been waiting very patiently, so I'd like to give you the opportunity, one question, if you one can question. Them, and then go down the panel and kind of wrap it up. Absolutely. This question's for David Mihalchik. Uh, many would argue that uh, Google was the first cloud service provider before the term even existed. And I've been told and I've read and I've seen that Google doesn't use virtualization or SANS. If DISA is to become the private cloud provider 
for all of the DOD and its uh, partners. At what point do you hit a critical mass and decide that virtualization and SANS is or are a uh, obsolete technology and you have to move to something else? Uh, well, it definitely won't be my decision. <laughs> uh, that, uh, uh, leave, leave that to, the, uh, to, to our engineering team. Uh, what, or did, did Google reach a critical mass and then change, or did you start right off the bat and know that uh, virtualization in SANS would not satisfy the demand, the I.O. demand that you're going to have with the uh, services that you're going to offer globally? Yeah, I think the model that, that, that we followed originally, you're, you're right, Google is a, a company that was built from the ground up as, as, a, you know, as a cloud starting in, in Larry and Sergey's garage, literally. Um, but, but the model that, that we've, we've followed, and, and, and much of this is, is, is discussed in, in the literature, and, and Google has discussed it, uh, uh, the, the approach that, that we take is, is different to this, the virtualization approach and the, uh, the approach that, that others are, are taking to, to cloud. Uh, uh, but in, ter in terms of the future, uh, and uh, I, the, the, your question, I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified. Uh, uh, to answer. I, I wouldn't mind jumping in on this a little bit because I do agree I with your observation. You do I don't think that Google actually decided to go to a distributed data model because they're a SaaS provider. They, they went there because they they have massive data requirements. And so if you look at the SAN industry right now in the market space, you, you see you know a significant downturn in that market space um, because and uh, that uh, cloud-based, network-based implementations, and especially operating on big data, requires a more parallel, uh, mo a parallel storage model in which you don't have that single point of failure and that single pipe in which you're put pushing all of the data through into a SAN. Um, and so we are seeing within IBM and other uh, technology providers uh, a race to the next generation storage devices and capabilities that have more of a spider um, topology than a single pipe topology. So your observation is exactly right spot on. And Google went and obviously tried to solve that internally by building their own um, you know, infrastructure. But from a commercial technology point of view, we're just catching up to that because big data has got such a, a huge impact on how we store and the throughput necessary. And just for the record, Salesforce doesn't use virtualization either. We will go from the ground up without it. We still won't use it. And this I, isn't a question then. I know I was only allowed one. All right. I just hope we don't uh, uh, invest in an obsolete technology just well, to find out later yeah. that we spent a lot of money. Well, so just I think, to I think what you I think what you I think what you'll find that I hope you guys agree with me that um, the moving something to cloud as a delivery model it's it's completely decoupled from the implementation um, and in fact what cloud means as a provider uh, what we've figured out is that it's really just a process optimization right um, Google most significant thing about Google is not which hardware they bought or whether they're using virtualization it's uh, the way that their the way that their architecture is laid out and the way that their internal processes work that allow them to have this uh, you know commodity take full advantage of commodity hardware um, recover quickly from failure you know be highly distributed I mean that's where the that's where the secret sauce is it's not that they chose VMware or Zen or KVM or something like that yeah I, I don't you. think that your SAN implementations are at, you know going to be you know you don't need to throw them away yeah. um, but what we're seeing are these little paradigm shifts. And big data requires a different storage topology than your traditional enterprise computing storage needs. And I, I think ultimately your, your question get, gets to the heart of, uh, of the, what we talked about earlier. You know, does it make sense to build this yourself, or does it make sense to rely on uh, providers who are, are, are doing this all, all the time? And, and the, we'll find out the, the answer to that over the, you know, the, the coming years. As I said, these guys can and do talk about cloud all day. Um, we've got to get off the stage, but um, they'll be around, so if you want to talk to them offline, I see there's a couple other folks with questions. I'm sure they'd love to chat more, and that's, that's why they're here. So thanks so much uh, to the panel for, for talking to us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks.